So this is actually one of the first stem cell transplantation programs to be uh, started worldwide. Uh, we did our first transplant in 1972. Uh, back in those days, uh, very few transplants were done per year. We typically did just a few per year. Things have changed rather substantially in the past couple decades. Uh, and now we do uh, in the range of 550 to 570 transplantations a year. There are two major types of transplantation that we do. The first is called autologous transplantation, uh, meaning that the uh, patient's own stem cells are used. The second type of transplant that we do is allogeneic, and using family members, unrelated donors, umbilical cord blood, uh, matched donors, mismatched donors, uh, for a variety of blood diseases, uh, leukemias, lymphomas, uh, congenital disorders, uh, and various forms of blood, uh, uh, bone marrow failure. And these are principally done in uh, a couple situations, the first being those people who have an intrinsic bone marrow disorder. And these are commonly leukemia or other forms of bone marrow failure, such as myelodysplastic syndrome or aplastic anemia, or even patients who have uh, congenital bone marrow disorders, such as thalassemia or sickle cell anemia. So if we go back uh, to the early days of transplantation, really the only uh, acceptable donor was a mass sibling which is great. Mass sibling transplantation is a very effective way to go, except that with the average family size in the United States of being less than two children per family, the chance of finding a matched donor in a family is less than 25%. So the more people in the registry, the better, but there are limitations on that uh, as well. And so over the past few years, we have devoted our attention to doing uh, transplantation using donors that are only partially matched. And that allowed us to cross HLA barriers, that is to perform successful transplantation uh, using donors that were not fully matched. And cord blood transplantation since the late 1980s has become a very important part of our armamentarium. But even then, we didn't have enough donors for everybody. And over just the past few years, we sort of cracked the code for how to do mismatch transplantations, that is to use a brother or a sister who is only half matched to use a parent as a donor for uh, an offspring who is, uh, by, uh, for genetic purposes, an obligate half match, or a child to his parent. This is called haploidentical transplantation, and for many years we couldn't do it, but in the past few years we solved the technical, uh, the technical barrier to doing that, and now we can find a donor for just about everyone. If I look back on my career, uh, in 1981, if you were 35, that was the upper age limit where we did transplantation. And that limited us to doing on the order of 20 or 30 transplants a year back in those days. Well, we recognized that it was a problem and that was a limitation to what we were doing. Uh, and as we uh, advanced in our understanding of the basic biology of the diseases, as we improved in our ability to provide supportive care, as we learned how to reduce the side effects of, this, of the transplantation what we call conditioning regimens, the chemotherapy and radiation that are administered, and how better to control graft-versus-host disease, we were able to offer transplantation to older and older people. So now, uh, for instance, last year we did 570 transplantations. Uh, the average age is about 55 or 60. Uh, and we're doing transplantations up until, the, up until the age of about 75, which I would never have imagined uh, in 1981 as a, as a fellow in transplantation. The future of transplantation, uh, I think, looks very bright. Uh, we are progressively understanding these diseases more. We are coming up with better uh, antibiotics. Uh, as we understand the underlying biology of the diseases, we're able to target those, uh, uh, the frailties of the cancer cell. So. While some of these newer therapies may not be curative in and of themselves, they may uh, uh, enhance the cure when we combine them with transplantation, and that's where one of the, uh, the important places that we're going. And this is one of the largest transplant programs in the world, and one of the advantages of being in a big program is the experience of the people who work here. Um, our nurses and our physicians uh, are uh, exposed to a large number of patients who have transplant-related complications and therefore become uh, highly experienced in the management of these complications that 
to a degree that I think you might not see in a smaller center. It also gives us a critical mass of uh, uh, patients who have kindly volunteered to participate in research activities. And these research activities have, without question, uh, improved the outcomes of people uh, who have gone through transplantation. And the more we can, uh, we can leverage that, uh, the, the more effective we are and the better our outcomes become.